Okay, folks, we'll get get this going here just a just a little bit early, like one minute early. So give everyone a chance to start uh, hopping into the stream, seeing what's up. So basically, here's what's going on this week and for the next six weeks. So um, I wanted to do this um, for a while now, but I wasn't quite sure how I wanted to go about doing it. And basically what I wanted to do is I wanted to run a course on writing, right? Or construct a, some sort of internet course where people could very easily go through all the steps necessary to think up an idea for a book, um, write the book, and put the book out, publish it in some in some fashion. And once I kind of put two and two together the other week, uh, I was like, yeah, I could just do this with the with the streams because this way people can come in, they can participate basically in a seminar. Um, you get all the information for whatever you want, um, whatever you need, whatever's lacking by asking a question in the chat, which is extremely uh, extremely convenient. And then, of course, you also get um, you also get the opportunity to hear answers from that live and kind of follow up. And that you can also get information for what other people are doing. And it also sets a pace. So what I want to do here is I want to do a six-week course um, where at the beginning of that of those six weeks you're going to start with an idea. And today we're just going to look at an overview of the process. At the end of those six weeks, you're ready to either put a book up for pre-order or to just publish it. I'm going to gear this course towards people who haven't published books before. So it's going to address, uh, I think, a lot of the shortcomings and a lot of the scattered information that exists on how to do this process, um, rather than gearing it towards people who've maybe published before. Um, and so to that effect, I'm also keeping in mind that a lot of people who are publishing their first book um, also have different needs than people who've published previous books as far as what they need that book to do. So your first book is probably not going to be a big money maker, but what it can be is a big list builder. It can be a way to get your name out there, um, attract some readers, attract some viewers. So we're probably going to look at how to put your book out as a free book that people can find on Amazon, click on, read, join your mailing list, and then maybe they will read or buy your follow-up books. Um, that's really what I'm going to gear most of this course towards. If you have published books before, ebooks before, there's probably some information that might be useful for you, but I really wanted to give everything in one place with one um, set of pacing to help people who are, are wanting to do this but haven't been able to put everything together. So on the one hand, the academic environment, I think, um, is very lacking as far as how uh, how well it teaches people to actually do the craft, to actually write, especially writing books. Um, and of course, there's virtually no information in higher education for how to publish and forget about how to market. Now, this course actually won't go deep into how to market things, but we will be at least grazing the surface of marketing strategies because this book is going to be itself a possible marketing strategy for lots of people. So if you've written a book before, this could be a freebie book to, to kind of help build your brand, or it could be a 99 cent read. Uh, and I'm going to talk about all of the particulars there. So um, one of the things that I think is really important to me before I before I dig into all of this is that uh, I want to do this free. Like I don't want to charge people money for it because money is a barrier to entry. And so uh, one of the things that you'll see in this course is that I'm all about lowering barriers to entry. Uh, we're going to focus a lot on the cheapest or the, the most freebie kind of way that you can actually get a book out there. Um, now, depending on how you want to do it, you may want to use a budget, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about today. Uh, and how you want to set that budget up or how you want to spend that money um, is really going to depend on a couple of things and where you're at as a writer and as well as what uh, kind of market you're thinking about getting into. Um, so that's what we're looking at today. Before I get into that, I don't know if there's a whole lot of uh, channel news or site news. These six weeks of write stream are going to be the last six weeks of a writing stream that's weekly. And after that, I'm probably going to move it into a monthly stream. And then the other three weeks, I really just want to talk to creators and talk about 
genres and just talk about uh, other things. So it's going to be mostly a format focusing on new material and new work and other people's stuff rather than uh, how to how to write your own books. Though I still have, I still plan on having lots of writing content just available on the channel as well as um, probably having a live stream about once a month that's really dedicated to um, to getting into writing. Now I don't have a syllabus for you guys because one of the things about this course is that I uh, I want you to adapt it to you. And so if I provide something like a syllabus, if it becomes too formalized, then you're going to feel like you have to do everything I say. The point is not to do everything I say. It's I'm going to tell you how I do it. I'm going to show you how to do it. And you, of course, can do things your own way and be creative in your own way along this path. So um, if I talk about how to structure a story um, or I give you like a story structure, that can be a starting place or you can discard it and come up with your own that works for the story you have in, in mind. The point is that there's information there for those who need it. Um, and I've already gotten emails since I put out a, you know, put out a general list email about the fact that I'm going to be running the stream. Um, so I've already gotten some emails about like, what do you, how do you do this? How do you do that? Lots of little particular things. So feel free to email me anytime, stu at dbspress.com. And I'll attempt to answer it on the stream or just shoot you back an email with the correct answer right there. And then I'll follow up with the stream as well. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the course format as we go in here. Um, let me see how many people are actually watching. I've got about 43, so not that many. But uh, you can watch this after the fact and hopefully get a lot of the information here. Now, I'm going to show you something a little weird it's really it's a Photoshop document, but the point the point of this document is really because I like whiteboards, and uh, because I like whiteboards, uh, that means that I don't have a whiteboard really to, to show you guys what I want to what I want to show you. So this is actually a Photoshop document, and I'm just gonna be writing on it. Um, here's our basic course outline. Okay, we're gonna be looking at six weeks. Um, let's see. Let's get a paintbrush. Boop. So. Here's our course outline. Um, so week one, we're just gonna talk about overview and the four phases of um, book, book creation. They're called the four phases of book creation. I'll talk about those. Um, week two is we're gonna do planning. So we're gonna go through those four phases, planning. And if you're wondering about my bad handwriting, trust me, it would look worse on a big whiteboard, but I love drawing on the whiteboard, so that's where it is. Uh, week three is gonna be drafting. And then we're also gonna do that for week four. So we're gonna give you at least two weeks to draft. Week five, we're gonna start looking at revisions. And by the way, what I expect you to do is after planning, planning should only take a couple days, you should start um, your draft after week two, for sure. So after next week's stream, you should be starting your draft. You should be finishing it by the time we get to this. So that's three weeks of drafting, possibly a whole month, which is a lot of time, even if you're a newbie. And uh, last one is going to be all the stuff for publication. And if it takes me two weeks to get through all the information on publication, it takes two weeks. But that's going to include how to format your document. That's going to include um, you know, how to format your document for making a paperback how to either hire a cover artist or buy a pre-made cover. I'm going to be gearing this more towards either buying a pre-made cover or making your own cover. If you are not a graphic designer or you don't have graphic design experience, obviously I have graphic design experience. So if you're not if you don't have a lot of experience doing this stuff, chances are you're going to want to buy a pre-made cover. Um, not that you can't learn if you want to dedicate the time to learning and developing a a small skill set or you're very happy with a very simple cover say a basic image with a, like a gradient background like it went over with the, the Robert Jordan book so the Robert Jordan book that we duplicated it's a super simple cover you could make something like that yourself um, very very easily and I can give some other resources for how to make your own um, make your own book covers if you want to do that that takes time but for a lot of people they don't want to spend a lot of that time doing that they'd rather hire someone that's very competent and the reality is you can get a lot of pre-made covers for like 50 bucks um, so 
it, you know, might be worth the 50 bucks to you to just not have to worry about it. For me, I like to design my covers myself because then I actually get more value since they're better than the $50 covers in general, and they could be more to my specifications for what I want with, uh, you know, my genre work and, and that kind of stuff. Um, so let's take a look at the chat and see if there's any questions before I dig into like the four phases. Um, and we'll go from there. Let's see. We haven't missed much. Our story is about orphans, a good setting for uh, themes of free will versus determinism. Just curious. I don't know. Um, I, I actually don't know. I think, I think orphans are more just about getting the audience to feel sympathy, um, feel a certain amount of sympathy for the character. I think it's kind of like an easy way to, to get sympathy and get the person on the side, uh, get the reader on the side of the, the character. Um, there's a five euro tip. Thank you for Clean Pulse. What percentage of your story ideas go from inception to outline? What percentage go from outline to draft? Finished Voices of Void recently really enjoyed it. I would say 100%, I'd say like 90% goes from inception to outline and about 200% goes from outline to draft. Now, why is that percentage higher? Well, as I draft, I bring in more ideas. That just tends to be the way that I work. Um, I have a I have a rougher outline than some writers. Some writers do a scene by scene. They include a ton of information. It's just really like very front loaded with what they want to do. It's very well planned out. You can plan out very intensely in advance, and I'm going to show you how to do that. Or you can do what I do, which is I have the event sequence listed and how I execute each scene. I do it as I go. And there's advantages to each. If you're doing it as you go, then you're keeping track very closely of the flow of the narrative and the flow of the prose, where the important pieces of action are, where the tension is. So um, like the current book that I've been writing, which I haven't, I haven't worked on in a couple of days, I become keenly aware that, that a significant or very tense scene hasn't happened in a certain number of words. And I like to say that there's something important that needs to happen about every thousand words. It's easier for me to keep track of that if I have a shorter list of events versus a longer list of events or a more detailed ones. Uh, because you, you may not realize that there's no tension in several scenes in a row when you're outlining it and you may have to adjust. It's good to be able to adjust, but I, I tend to not do that much. Um, but I, I would say I don't really discard ideas as I go. Some people do. Um, I generally don't. I keep the, I keep things pretty loose and bring in more ideas because, as I develop characters, I feel like it's more interesting to. You know, there's just more variety that you can do with them as you as you get going. Um, let's see here. Anything else? Thank you for doing this, film girl. You're welcome. Um, this is going to be awesome. Thank you, Jared. Do you think it's a good idea to discuss ideas online uh, with one name but publish books under another? It's not a bad idea. The ideas are cheap. So here's the thing. Uh, ideas are cheap. There's a million of them. Nobody's paying enough, close enough attention. So if you're writing under a pseudonym but you're talking about ideas here, that's not. I don't foresee that ever being an issue. Uh, ideas are not what's going to get you sued unless unless you have somebody like Harlan Ellison who like sued I'm trying to whoever made Terminator um, not James Cameron but sued the company for ripping off his story he had a story about soldiers that traveled back in time and like did battle it's like Terminator was nothing like his his story but uh, he wanted to sue anyway and the reality was I don't think I think it would have been hard for him to win in court you never know with some copyright stuff because once it gets in the hands of a jury, it's just who knows. Um, but you know, little ideas here and there. That's not that's not going to be an issue. Um, already done with one and two because I'm a pantser with a vague outline on page 220 right now. Okay, um, I'm going to write a book alongside these courses. That's the purpose. The purpose is to at the end of this, you will have a completed work, and I'll talk about all of the dimensions we're going to add there. Um, how do you manage your own self-awareness? I find my sense of work being bad is overpowering when compared to the masters I admire. I don't know. I focus on the micro as I'm doing it. I just focus on writing good prose. Um, I was thinking about using a painting I will make for a cover, like the Bob Ross blurred so people insert their own image to its vagueness. Is this a bad idea? 
everyone seems mine is an alt history with this uh, synarchic story. I okay, sorry, I'm reading two of these. So Lego Greens, I I think it's a bad idea, but we will talk about that when we get to publication. There's some reasons why you want to avoid covers which do not peg your genre. The main goal of the cover is to set up the expectations of the reader, and that means pegging the genre right off the bat. So things which are blurry or weird, you may think that they're creative, and they are, but they don't work for what you want them to do. The purpose of a cover is not to reflect the creativity of the work at all. It's just to sell the book. And so the more you're able to divorce like some kind of weird creative belief in your cover from your cover, the better. Now, I can just as easily play the other side of that. Book covers, older painted book covers, used to look at them over and over again. They really mattered. Um, but nowadays, and for the purpose of this course, you're really going to want to focus on book covers that are pretty simple and pretty straightforward and, and peg your story really well. And you're, you'll find that a lot of pre-made covers will just kind of, uh, kind of fit that. I would not recommend using 3D models on your covers, ever. They just never look right. I've seen about a hundred billion of them. That's an, I don't know. I've seen a thousand covers with 3D models on the cover. They always look bad. So either go with a painting or go with a photo composite. Um, I'll do some maybe some companion content sometime, show you how to composite photos together so that they don't look like garbage. Most of my covers... Um, are photo comp. So like this one is super simple. Like you could actually do this one with a minimal amount of knowledge. Not exactly because there's a lot of little technical Photoshop things that are here, but it's just a picture of a crown on a maroon background with some color dodge effects and some light effects. It, and then then good like typefacing. So a cover, main, main elements that go into a cover is a good image that catches the attention uh, of a reader, um, a really good title, uh, title and a really good font that uh, that kind of pulls everyone into this, and then of course a name. And this isn't this doesn't this doesn't hit the book super hard. A painted cover would do it better, but it does a good job. It actually this cover is probably my strongest cover in terms of people clicking on it. Um, you know, this one is uh, a dude screaming and a planet that I generated in Photoshop and a bunch of jellyfish tentacles, right? Here's a really early photo comp I did. If you guys have seen the new Star Wars uh, poster, it's just this, right? It's like a small figure on something and then some eyes above in some stars and clouds. Like this is a really simple photo comp. One of the first ones I ever did. Um, now you can't, you, I think you can still get it if you buy the paperback of this, but no one, no one really buys this book. So uh, anyway. Versus a painting. I think paintings are the best. Anyway, let's move on. Let's talk about the four phases here. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Dark, uh, Darth Kilhoon, mine is an alt history with a synarchic story. One side is a resistance story against the combination. The other is a royal drama and a huge German empire. Um, okay, interesting. We'll talk about some of that. Screenwriter Max Landis said that if... Uh, whoops. A prospective writer isn't writing every day, then he shouldn't bother being a writer. Thoughts? There's so many counterexamples to that, I can't even begin. There's writers that only write a month a year, and the rest of the time they do nothing. <laughs> and they're great writers. There's guys like Michael Moorcock that could write a book in a weekend and then just take three months off from writing. So, no, uh, that's nonsense. I've also taken literally years off from playing music and gone back into it and been great. So... Um, yeah, it's a skill that can diminish the more time you spend away from it. But the idea that it's something like, you know, if you do it every day, of course, that's going to that's gonna be better than not doing it every day. But there's plenty of writers who don't do it every day and then they're fine, you know, including me. I've taken time off from it or, you know, if I miss a week, I don't worry about it. Or if I, and obviously I can only do one thing at a time. So if I'm editing something or if I'm, working on a bunch of marketing little doodads. I don't worry about writing the prose for that day. Uh, otherwise, I'll never get done the other things I need to get done. Um, and there's, a, there's a bunch of other counterexamples. Um, I wasn't talking about story ideas. I meant using different names to avoid letting readers know one's social and political opinions and such. Yeah, that doesn't... I mean, yeah, you, you can use a pseudonym. It's not going to... It doesn't matter. You you can use a pseudonym if you if you don't want people to know your real name but you should be willing for that pseudonym to be your brand right like i don't use a pseudonym but 
You can. Doesn't matter. Uh, certain genres you need to use a pseudonym, like erotica. So if you're a male writer writing erotica, you should use a female pseudonym. Um, film girl, my laptop keyboard isn't working, so I'm gonna have to try and write this book on my phone. That can kind of work, right? Get a Bluetooth um, keyboard. Let me show you. I've written like large passages of needle ash on this. True story. This is a pluggable um, Bluetooth keyboard. Looks like this. And uh, pop it open. It's a full size keyboard. It doesn't feel perfect because you can see it kind of, it could easily rock. And some of the some of the keys are just slightly off, um, so it's just especially the numbers are just slightly off. But for most things, it, it really feels fine. So I've I've actually done a ton of writing on this with my phone. The little case for it has a little pop up thing that you can put your phone in. So like you can just pop your phone open at the coffee shop and write, and then this folds up like this. This was forty bucks by the way. Goes in a little case that's. So, that big and then you could put it if you're a girl you could easily fit it in your purse if you're a dude you better be wearing cargo shorts because it's kind of big but um i never had a problem with that because i usually carry it back but yeah so get one of those those are those are great you could totally write a, a book on your phone yes you can it's possible um i think i prefer the muramasa cover with the blood on the white thank you for that feedback i'll probably i think i'm going to try to use both somehow do a little A-B testing. I haven't done it still because I've been lazy. Also, Vanilla WoW came out. <laughs> I'm not playing WoW not right now, guys. I'm doing this stream, so you guys should be thankful. Um, what's best, to have a prologue or no prologue? If you ask different people, they have different opinions. If the prologue is very interesting, have a prologue. If the prologue is boring or it's too hard to discover the context of the prologue once you get into the main narrative, you should skip it. If the prologue is, is an info dump, I would skip it. If the prologue is a very short info dump, like two paragraphs, and th that info is necessary, do it. I've done very different kinds of prologues in the past. I've done ones that have, like, they're like a myth mythology thing that's like reading the Bible, just to really set up the myth of what's there. I actually haven't released that. But <laughs> it'll come out, probably probably 2020 So when that book will come out. Um, so, yeah, you can... It just depends on how interesting that prologue is. I say, personally, I think it's good to to lead with something interesting rather than info dumps. But, you know, do it your own way. Um, that's what I dislike about the 3D models. They're all over Amazon. They look awful and rehashed. I agree. They look terrible, and I would never use them. And if I had a cover designer who's like, I'm going to do, here's a 3D dragon, and be like, I'll pass. I'd rather spend 10 times as much for a legitimate artist to paint a dragon. And uh, I, there's tons of artists that are looking for work. You could probably get one for way less than that. It's just uh, I like certain artists. Like if you wanted to hire, you could get uh, you could get someone like um, Karen Byatt who did this image. Uh, I actually licensed that image. Uh, he does like the Twilight Force covers. He does concept art for lots of things. He does amazing dragons, so if you wanted a dragon, I'd rather have him paint it, even if it's like 10 times more expensive, because it just looks so much better. It looks it looks so much better. Um, I, think, da, 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 da. I have a friend at work who's an illustrator, and hopefully he'll help me create a book cover. Keep in mind there are, there are principles to cover design that artists don't often know, so you may have to like give lots of information. <laughs> I'm gonna use a pen name because my last name is hard for people to pronounce. Yeah, that's that's an idea. Um, you know, I've I've talked to some people that like use a pen name because they feel like their name is too ethnic somehow. Which, I mean, I think it just depends. You know, they want to they want to use an English name for some reason. Um, do you think that writing on a typewriter instead of a computer can have benefits? I wouldn't do it. So I don't know. I don't think I would ever do that. Um, how do you keep your energy up while staying on a healthy schedule? Tea and being really, really interested in everything I have to do. So I have some green tea here. Mm. Green tea. I drink lots of green tea. I drink lots of tea. I drink a lot of caffeine. And my 
life is also set up so it's very intense all the time. It's not a big deal to not sleep because there's so much interesting things going on. That being said, if I have an opportunity to nap, dude, I can take a nap. Like if my my baby goes to sleep and I'm like tired, like this afternoon, she's like, dude, she's taking a nap. I'm like, I'm just gonna I'm gonna take a 20 minute nap. You know, it's good. Do you have WoW open in the background on character screen, or is your wife uh, hope helpfully hitting spacebar every five minutes while you entertain us? No. No, I'm, I, I decided to play on a server without a queue. I couldn't get into um, Herod. I couldn't get into Herod. So I'm actually on Sulfurus right now. And my character's name is Aphella. A-P-H-E-L-L-A. It's Paladin. If anybody wants to run... Um, if anybody wants to run Deadmines this weekend, I'm playing on Sulfurus. <laughs> so let's see what else. And I'll get to these four phases. Okay. Thank you for showing your keyboard. Your reply super helpful. You're welcome. You, it's like I got it on Amazon for like 40 bucks. And it was a great buy. It's been great. You charge it with a USB charger like a phone. Um, do you ever look for cover artists on DeviantArt? Is that a good idea? Absolutely I do. And I think it's a great idea. There, That's how I discovered Karen Byatt. I saw him. I'm like, this guy looks like the artist from Twilight Force. And I was like, it is. I have to hire this guy. There's a great artist on there. You could probably find great artists to do cheap work. Um, or you can find images that you like and just pay the person for it. Just like, hey, let me license this image for 50 bucks and I'm going to use it for a book cover. And they'll probably do it because they painted it anyway, just for like their portfolio. Um, so it's really, yeah, it's great. It's so full of stuff though. It's hard to find what you want, but yeah, DeviantArt's great. And then there's some there's some great photo comp artists on DeviantArt too if you want to go for photo covers. Photo covers are the big hit. That's why the new Star Wars poster, which used a toy for Emperor Palpatine. That's why we did a they did a photo comp uh, posters because it's just it's the end thing right now. Like paintings were the end thing in the 70s and now it's photo comp. This is how it is. Is it generally better to have an ending in mind before starting your draft, or do you think it's better to let the ending emerge organically? I believe it is essential to have an ending in mind and I'll talk about that so let's talk about the four phases of book creation okay guys boop, boop. all right four phases so the first one is planning and this is what we'll be doing the next um, two weeks so during planning you're gonna be doing all the things that happen before you start writing the draft and so when you're planning I'll give you let me just give you the four planning it's planning drafting Revision, publication, planning, drafting, revision, publication. So when you're planning, uh, there's a bunch of things that you're going to be doing when you're planning. So the first thing is you're going to be coming up with the setting. You're going to be coming up with uh, a list of basic characters. Let's see if I can shrink this down just a bit. A little too, a little too big for my taste. Like Twelve point. Okay. Um, and plot. Now, once you have these, from there you're going to come up with uh, an event sequence that uses all of these. So as you um, as you figure out the event sequence, which is mostly the plot. You can figure out what characters are doing what in the event sequence. And when you start drafting, you're going to be putting all of the setting information in the draft. So this is one thing that's difficult to plan ahead of time is what parts of the setting you're going to expose when. Um, it's easy to write with just the, the plot happening, but it's a lot more subtle action to try to describe, uh, particularly if you're doing like a fantasy setting or something like that. If it's a real world setting, it's a lot easier. Um, so that's planning. Um, and there's other things that go into planning that are that are kind of the meta of planning. Um, so let's talk about the meta planning, which is what we're going to focus on today. So meta planning involves not just planning the story itself, which is what we're going to look on next week, but uh, planning all of the things that are going to go into the process. So you're going to we're going to plan our timeline. In this case, we're looking at six weeks. I already talked about it. Um, so it's good to have a timeline, in my opinion. So a timeline keeps you honest. Uh, it keeps you on track. It keeps you working towards your goal. 
If you don't have a strong timeline, it's okay, but just be aware you're probably gonna take longer to finish your story than if you had a proper timeline. So I'm a big fan of timelines. So we know we're gonna spend this next week planning and then we're gonna start drafting after next week and then we're gonna finish drafting three weeks after that and then we're gonna begin revisions and then we're gonna we're gonna finally go into our publication thing in week six, week seven. That should mean that you know you should finish your you should be able to finish your rough draft like on the 18th of September. You should be done by it, right? Because let's see here, next week we'll talk about planning. We'll have two weeks of drafting. Yeah, you should be finished at least at the latest by the 25th of September. That's a lot of time. It's almost a month to write your draft if you're you're really on top of things. Um, and I kind of want to let, let me transition into talking about the next thing, which is um, just as important, which is the length of your book. So for the purpose of this course, we're looking at a length of about 15,000 words to about 30,000. And you can do more than that if you have a lot of drafting experience, but you have to think that 15,000 words a day is less than 1,000 words uh, per day. I mean, 15,000 words total is less than 1,000 words per day writing. Uh, and so if you have 21 days to actually write it at the maximum, 21,000 words, that's 1,000 words a day, that's very doable, that's two single spaced pages in Microsoft Word in Times New Roman. Just to give you an idea of what that length looks like for this course, a lot of my recent books have utilized um, have utilized this. So Voices of the Void is about 24,000 words, so it's within that range, it's a two hour read. Um, Crown of Sight is a is about the same length. I think it's 21,000, um, maybe 22,000. And it's again about a two hour read. So both of these books come out roughly the same length. So your final book will look something like this. Uh, this is long enough to publish as a floppy, as a paperback in eight by five and be able to sell it cheaply, um, order it cheaply, give it away or sell the ebook for 99 cents. If you want to think about the bigger range of this, um, these are about 30 to 40,000 are the needle ash, the original needle ash books before I did the big volume. Um, I originally published the entire thing as three volumes just to try out um, small volumes. And uh, I wasn't super happy with what came out of it, but uh, to give you an idea of this, this one's about 40,000 words. Uh, these ones are big enough that you can have the, you can have the title on the spine. You know, so once you get to a little bit lower, you're not going to have the title on the spine because Amazon's print on demand service won't allow. I'm going to be focusing on the Amazon print on demand because I know it. You can do Ingram Spark as well, but I wouldn't recommend a novice do Ingram Spark um, to begin. And there's a, there's a bunch of little reasons. If you want to think about the shorter end, like 15,000, that's going to be Garamesh and the Farmer, right? This is a pretty thin book. But it's still big enough that you can make a little floppy little book out of it um, that you could read. You know, so there you go. That's what we're looking at for length. So I picked that length because I felt like, you know, a, a novice could accomplish this um, within the length of this course. And so for a lot of people that it's going to be their first attempt at writing a book, this is good. Also, it's a short book. Short books are really good for list building because people can finish them in one setting. Short books in general do pretty well on Amazon because people like to be able to finish a book. It makes people feel really good. Okay, super chat from Jack Cole. I knew a few artists for hire on DeviantArt for my time there. How much would it wreck my bottom line to pay one of them 50 to $150? It wouldn't wreck your bottom line. So let's talk about ROA, ROI as part of the meta planning. So we'll talk about budget. Uh, let's We'll talk about that right now. So budget which is gonna also include um, ROI. ROI is return on investment. So your budget is gonna vary depending on what you want. 50 to $150 for a good cover is a, is a steal. Uh, a professionally designed book cover that's a photo composite done by a professional, 300 bucks, thereabouts. If you want to get a pre-made, you're looking at $50 to $150. If you can get an artist to do original art, even if they don't do any of the typefacing and you got to do that yourself in Inkscape, and I'll show you how to do that actually. Um, 
the the typefacing i can tell you everything you need to know and jack like if you just showed me the book cover i could tell you exactly like anything you needed to alter to make it just really stand out and look great um but if it was just for the art and then you did the typefacing yourself you're still getting a great deal so 50 to 150 dollars, i think is a great deal so i'd say for your book cover um let me so let's say here we'll, we'll go to budget we'll go um draw a little arrow here this looks like an arrow so the the cover for this 50 bucks on the lower end or your regional equivalent so 40 euro you know 40 pounds um, up to probably max 150 like you said that's totally doable for your first book if it's your first book it comes back to ROI okay ROI I want you to think about your return on investment not as you know, what is my, I don't know, metaphysical return on investment, but how long does it take for me to make back the money that I originally put into this? Now, if I'm telling you to put out a free book, what's gonna be the ROI? If you're not selling the book and you spend $150 on a cover, it's like, am I just losing $150 to publish this? No, because it's part of the entire package. If you're putting this book out to gain people on a mailing list, and I'll explain how to build a mailing list, what kind of, I use MailChimp uh, and I might switch. So if I switch in the next few weeks, I'll give information on that. Um, I'll probably try out a couple other ones just to see what they're like. MailChimp changed their interface in a way that I'm not happy with right now. Uh, and they also have upped their prices, which I'm not happy with either. <laughs> but it, it'll be free to start your mailing list. You won't have to pay money right off the bat. Um, but if it's building your mailing list and then that person converts into a sale later on, that's what you have to keep in mind. Um, people who don't know a lot about this business, and this is not to say anything bad about anybody, but they they think I'm being stupid when I give away my books. They're like, why would you give away a thousand copies of this book? I'm like, to get 10 reviews. They think, oh, the thousand copies that I gave away is a thousand sales I'm losing. No, only a small percentage of the thousand people that I gave a copy of my book to are actually going to read it, actually care about reading it, or would ever have paid money to get it. So I give away a huge number of copies so that some of those people who really like it will give me a review. Once you have that social proof on your, on your book page, then you can start advertising and selling the book. So you give away copies in order to build up the value of the brand. It's like an investment, but it doesn't cost you anything. So it's really hard to, to think about ROI when it's like you're investing time, you're giving away copies and stuff. So the, the whole thing about ROI is it's, it's time to recover and it's a total package. Again, sorry for my handwriting. It's old professor handwriting. I'm used to just zipping across the the, the zipping across the whiteboard really fast. So here's the other thing about budget too. So, you know, your cover may be at 50 to 150 dollars. There's other things that you have to keep in mind for your budget. You may want to run ads. And I'll tell you what kind of ads you can run early on to build a list. But you're probably not going to run Amazon ads because the purpose is not to convert right away. You're just going to be flushing money down the toilet. It's better to have your book be free than to do ads. But you can run some cheap ads on Facebook that will actually build your list. Um, you may want uh, to hire things like an editor. For this project, we're not gonna worry about editors because um, we're writing short fiction. It qualifies as short fiction and novella. And um, editors can be very, very pricey. And there's, a, there's other things. If, if you're gonna do an editor, I would save your money for like your big longer book where you really need more input into the entire thing. It's a lot easier to self-edit something that is small and easy to focus on. Uh, but if you wanted to hire an editor, you could. The other, the other thing is, if you hire an editor, now you're looking at additional time in the timeline. Uh, and kind of the purpose of this course is to think more like a pulp author, which is to write quickly, write well, and write things that people like to read. And that's the thing that we're looking at. So this is all meta planning. Um, other stuff with meta planning is gonna be um, things like 
genre. Things like, besides budget, besides genre, or to, you know, total strategy, like we talked about building a list. Oops. Total strategy. Uh, so we're gonna be building a list. So we're gonna be doing. So we're gonna be list building, we're gonna think of a total strategy. Um, you're gonna plan, so we did timeline, I think we got almost everything there. You want to think about uh, your publication platforms, um, and we are going to gear this one towards uh, all because we're going to be doing a free book. We want it on all platforms, and uh, we're going to do Amazon separately from all the others. We're going to use Draft to Digital for this course, but I'll explain some of the other ones. Um, some people like to use Smashwords. Uh, personally, I'm not a fan. There's some reasons for that, but draft to digital is frankly easier and, and better uh, and gives you more options for formatting and things like that. And we'll also like do little formatting things for your ebook for you, which is also nice. I'm trying to think if there's anything else for the meta planning. Um, yeah, so let's go through some of those, some of those things real quick. Um, so the timeline. We're looking at six weeks. Oh, I have to click on the active layer, of course. Let's um, let's pick a pick red here. All right. So the timeline, six weeks. Okay. Length, fifteen to thirty k. Did that. So twenty one k or 20K is probably what we're gonna be looking at. That's gonna be a two hour book. I've done that experimentation ahead of, ahead of time for you guys. These kind of books work and that's what I'm gonna to try to show you how to do. Um, if you're wanting to write a 100,000 word like epic book, you can do that. It's just, you're not gonna finish in six weeks. And so you have to adjust your timeline accordingly. If you wanna write a 100,000 word book, you gotta budget 100, 100 days to do that. 100 days for the drafting process. And then you're gonna to have to triple the editing time because it's gonna be much longer. And you're gonna to have to, but it, consequently you could also you know, sink more into your budget, things like that. Things that we're not gonna worry about budgeting for are things like copy, like copywriting, which is you know writing the blurb. We're not gonna hire someone to do that. We're not gonna hire anyone to market it. We're not gonna hire any marketing services. We're not gonna hire author services. We're gonna avoid all that and keep this really cheap because people need a place to begin with their platform. And that's what I really wanna look at. Um, let's take a look at the chat and see if there's any uh, any comments and questions before I keep going. A fella, oh, dude, you're you're playing a chick and not even a gnome rogue to dab on Horde. I uh, I may still play a gnome rogue, but it's going to be a girl with pink pigtails uh, because that that really and I'm, that really upsets people. I realized like getting killed by a girl gnome because they they see the girl player and they don't realize like there's you know, it's probably some giant hairy dude at his computer who smashed your face. And, uh, but especially a, a girl gnome rogue, it's like dudes don't play a lot of girl gnomes. So you think that it's a girl who just kicked your butt and it just like causes like a brain sh short, short circuit. I used to get like forum posts all the time when I gank people on a gnome. Uh, for whatever reason, it just really upsets people. They hate gnomes. Um, there's no realm transfers. I'm stuck on Herod forever. No, you just re-roll. Just re-roll uh, onto Sulfurus. Assuming I make money off a of self-published book compared to comparable to what you do. Oh, so that's a follow-up to the ten dollars. Yeah, absolutely. So fifty to hundred bucks. That's a great price. You know, I would love to to get custom art done for fifty to hundred bucks. Paintings done. Uh, my next fantasy book. If you know someone that can that can do legitimately good paintings for 150 bucks, I might do it. Um, but it's really hard. That's that's really cheap for me. And yeah, 50 bucks for a good cover is better if you have no experience with cover design. Absolutely. Um, or you can hire you can pay for the the art and then hire a designer to do the to do the lettering for like another 50 bucks. Like most cover designers, if it's like I have this image, can you turn it into a book cover? If it's a good cover image, they'll probably be like, "Yeah, I'll just you could, I'll do the typefacing for fifty bucks and just make it look really good." I'll show you how to do that though. You can do that in free programs. Uh, you don't have to use Photoshop. I use Photoshop for everything, but uh, these days. But you can do it in Inkscape. 
Um, I use many of these planning methods in writing my script. All this would really help me for writing a book. Absolutely. You can do it for the same thing for script. You can use it for writing a comic, planning what you're going to do with the comic book, everything. Some people build up a fan base by writing horror stories for the Reddit group No Sleep. Do you think that's a good idea? I have no idea because I don't use Reddit and so I have no idea. Uh, how do you know who to give copies to? I give copies to everyone. There's no downside. So anyone that wants a copy, like I give copies to my entire list. I have like a secret list that's a little bit deeper, you know, but um, I don't really use it very much. You know, I it, it basically, if you're on the list, you're a beta reader. Uh, everyone who got Voices of the Void, you got the beta copy initially. Uh, let's see here. If you want, I can email you links to their DA accounts. One I've personally hired and can vouch for. The other is a longtime friend who's worked for others. As long as it's, yeah, as long as the uh, as long as the portfolio is good, you know, I'm happy to work with them. Um, when I finish the next Eternal Dream book, I might have Jesse White redo covers for all of them, so that they're like really unified. So he does. He has a very very cool pulp style that I like. It's very reminiscent of. Uh, the kind of fantasy that I like to write. Okay, um, so now that we've kind of gone through all of all of that important stuff, let's talk about the meta, like the meta schedule. So the stuff that you really gotta really gotta decide on next week. And the next week, I'll give you basically some homework. The homework is um, what you what you have to think about for the next week. So. homework so the first one is to pick your genre we are going to talk about that in just a second what does that mean to pick your genre so you're going to think about your genre you're going to think about your setting uh, you're going to think about your setting you're going to imagine some characters. And you want to have a general story idea in the next week. So this is going to be a conflict and an ending, a resolution to it. So maybe you imagine, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, for how we're going to do this. So before I get into some ideas with synthesis, um, I want to talk about genre. And so I've showed this program before, and I'll show it again. This is called Publisher Rocket. You don't have to get a subscription to this, but you can get it. I use it for a bunch of advertising stuff um, that's very useful to me. <laughs> oh, real quick, let me answer a question. Do you think using public domain paintings for cover images can be a good idea? It can be, but here's the thing is that those don't often make compelling covers. Um, so it's a way to do it cheap, but they don't often make great covers. I think it wants to update this. All right, what we're gonna look at for this is we're gonna look up categories to think of genres. So. Big things about genres are going to be like science fiction, fantasy, stuff like that. If you are wanting to write to market, which you do not have to do, in fact, if it's your first book, don't worry too much about this, but we're just going to think about it. Um, we're going to look at some of the categories. And so let's say we want to write a book in fantasy. We're going to write a fantasy book. I think it's going to be fantasy and science fiction or something here. Science fiction and fantasy. You're going to see a bunch of ebook categories that pop up. These are big ones, right? Dystopian. All these categories contain elements about the setting. So this is what you, you go to for your thinking of setting. Um, and what you can actually do, the Amazon bestseller rank of number one will give you an idea of how hard it is to get number one in that category. So dystopian, Amazon bestseller rank, the number one is eight. That means you gotta be selling a lot of books. 
So if we look at sales to 25, that's sales really to be visible. We're gonna go to see if you could just sell a book and get visible. If you're writing in Arabic, someone might be doing Arabic, you could sell three books and be number one. We're skipping literary criticism, we're not doing that. Stargate, um, these are activities and puzzles. If you're doing teen young adult space opera, this is probably a really good one to do. So if you're doing space opera, in fact, maybe I'll do this one. Maybe I'll do like a space opera book uh, for part of this course. Space opera is gonna be stuff like Star Wars. So maybe I'll do teen and young adult space opera. This gives you an idea. Okay, we're gonna do it in space. We're gonna have some magic elements. And there's your setting and there's your genre, which should inform you know your characters. Maybe you have a space wizard and you have like a marine or something like that. Boom, you're doing space opera. Myths and legends, Asian. This I actually, I don't know if Muramasa's in teen and young. It shouldn't be if it is. It might, they might have stuck it in teen and young adult. If they stuck Muramasa in there, I really feel sorry for the teen who picks it up and like is reading about intestines and stuff like that. Um, country and ethnic, you know, any of these. Mermaids, so if you're gonna write a mermaid story, you could really like dominate mermaids. <laughs> Magical realism, I guess that's, apparently that's very popular in Latin America and Spanish speaking countries. Doctor Who video game ad adaptations, you know. So you can look at some of these on Publisher Rocket and get an idea. And of course, mine are always in just science fiction and fantasy, so they end up very, you know, very buried compared to other popular works. But I do okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right, great pro great questions here. Let me let me get a couple of these. Um what program do you use to write your books? Microsoft Word. I will show you, this is important because um, I'm gonna use Microsoft Word to format the ebook and I'm gonna use Microsoft Word to format the um, the print book as well. So I use Microsoft Word for everything. I don't use Scrivener, I don't use any of that stuff. Scrivener offers exactly zero features I care anything about. Um, I just like a blank page without a bunch of other crap getting involved with it. Um, that's what I like to do. What are the best methods for developing a main protagonist? And would these methods work for developing an antagonist? Depends what you mean by developing. If you mean in your mind developing it, or do you mean like developing it on the page? Because developing it on the page is you just have them go through the plot and have them have a personality that, you know, where their motivations are actually clear with the, the plot and they develop themselves. You don't really have to think about it just have to have a good plot. A lot of times people focus on character development without realizing that characters develop through the plot. If you have a good plot, you don't have to worry about it very much. If I have a story about elves with bows and arrows and magic fighting cyborgs in modern day, uh, which I do, which genre is that? Sci-fi fantasy? Um, it'd probably be just fantasy. Um, you could, it could be cyberpunk. So like, let's see if there's like a cyberpunk here. There might be cyberpunk. Yeah, it'd be cyberpunk is what I would what I would call it. Um, so cyberpunk, this would be the category. Let me show you. You got to sell fifty nine. It's a pretty popular category. You can see that the you know bestseller rank of number one is like top one hundred. That's really high. Um, but bestseller rank of number twenty five is quite a bit lower. So pretty popular. That would be cyberpunk. So yeah. Cyberpunk, it's pretty popular. You could you could try to get a little bit narrower there if you want a narrower one, but I would just write the, the story you have in mind. Aiden Wolf, any version's fine, right? I use Microsoft Word 2010. Yeah, I use Microsoft Word 2010. Is there a mermaid's horror subgenre on Amazon? Yes. Paranormal and urban mermaids. So this would include any horror elements because it's paranormal. So yeah, mermaids. Uh, how do you pick interesting character traits and what's the best way to shape and develop your main characters if that makes any sense? So think of a regular person and what is something that's interesting about them. If you're gonna describe your best friend to some other person, what's the first thing you'd say about them? And that's gonna be their character trait. And if you think about character traits in that way, 
then it's really easy to do. Another way to do it is to think of these character archetypes that I talk about from time to time. Is he a bad boy? Is she a goody two shoes? Uh, is she an everyman? Is this guy like Satan? You know, think of the character archetypes and then create a variation from there. Okay, and the variation is going to be what's going to keep that character interesting to new people. So if it's a bad boy, but like he's good at math and he keeps that secret, that's good. I guess I'm imagining like a teen teen romance or something for something like that. Uh, if she's a goody two shoes, except she's she secretly cheats on tests and she doesn't want people to know. That's great. Like that's a great little variation. Um, uh, Nitaku, I uh, just came up with one where a kid in a modern setting realizes he can learn magic and accidentally traps his hometown in the land of the Winter Fae and has, a, has to find a way back. That's great. So actually, this is a really good one. Um, this would just be high fantasy or fantasy um, where the first act, in fact, there's already an act structure just built into that description, that log line. First act is the conflict where he ends up accidentally sucking his hometown into some fey land. Um, the second act would be him trying to figure out how to get it back. At the end of the second act, he would fail at that, but find the correct way to get it back and have to uh, think about it a new way, and then he would save the town. Um, and you could even have a B story that's like he falls in love with some, some chick from the fey, some fairy girl who's like an elf or something. And, of course, the tension is she's going to come back to the real world with him. Maybe he decides at the end that he's going to stay in the Feyland but save his town so he could be with her. There's a, You have a romance B story. What's your C story going to be? Your C story is going to be the king of the Winter Fey wants all, all of these mortals because the Fey are dying and they need more mortals or something. Um, it would be his little story. Or the best friend's story which is about him being tempted by the Winter Fae to counteract his friend. That would be your C story. So or right away, you have a bunch of ways that you could write that book. And I know I just told you like a bunch of plot. That's your basic structure. And that's going to be part of your planning that we do next week is to come up with that plot structure. But for now, you, sh you should think about log lines like that. It's great. What are your thoughts on the concept of <laughs> equitastrophe? I don't know what that is. I don't know what uh, you catastrophe. Oh, you catastrophe, like a good catastrophe, I guess. I don't know if I've ever seen that word before, dude. You ever intentionally try to implement it in your stories? <laughs> um, no, I've never thought of that in my life. Sorry. Maybe, maybe you know more about things than I do. Do you think it best to have an unsympathetic antagonist for your first book? I think it's. It's the easiest way to go. The more time that you have to develop an antagonist, the more you can have them be sympathetic. But generally, you, if, if you want somebody, it's, if you want the reader to be conflicted about who should win, you can have a sympathetic antagonist. Um, if you think about a movie like The Fugitive, the antagonist is, is a good guy. <laughs> it's not a bad guy. But yeah, generally for most most kind of fiction that readers really like, they like they like bad guys more than good guys. I'm currently on my first novel. I finished my outline and I'm starting on my first draft. Okay, you're ready to go. But again, you have to think of length. So if you if you're not certain how long, let's talk about length for a second. I'm gonna pop this back over here. So let's talk about length because length is really important. How do you know how long your book's going to be? If you don't have any experience writing a book, it's hard to tell. But for let's let's imagine a hundred thousand word novel. You're generally going to have about sixty k. That's the A story. You're going to have about thirty k, which is the B story and about 15k I know that makes 105 I'll just 5 15k that's your C story so notice it gets divided in half each time so you know your A story would be the main conflict this would be romance usually 
is he going to get the girl? Is she going to attract the? She can turn the bad boy into a good guy. Um, and then this is going to be the the best friend. What's his conflict? You know. Um, so that's that's it. And usually the C story, the best friend is going to contribute somehow to the resolution of the A story. So this is mostly third act, right here. So towards the, the the last third of the book is where you have a little subplot that fixes this. Um, a really standard three act outline. I should talk about this next week, but here we go. We're going to be doing this this week. Um, you have uh, act one is a uh, conflict exposition, and then act two is going to be chaos. Act three is um, finding a solution. And in between this, between these two, like right here, you have a failure. So you usually have the conflict, you have an attack, this is for more fantasy stuff or action stuff, thrillers. So you have the conflict, you have uh, something break that puts everything in motion after you've exposed it. You have an attack which makes the protagonist run away. You have a bunch of chaos in the middle of the book where you're like, what's happening? Ah! And uh, then you figure out, okay, I think we could beat him like this. And then you don't beat the bad guy and you have to find a solution. Every Brandon Sanderson book uses this. Like every single one of them, <laughs> you know. So if you like his books, that's basically his plots. Like for virtually every book, virtually every book is this exact format. Um, so it works, you know. And then of course you got to think of your own variations to this. Now I don't stick too tight to this, but it's just it's an idea. It's like somewhere in the third of the middle third of the book, you got to have the hero get really beaten up and run away. And then they have to fail and not know how to succeed. And you think that, that they've lost the plot. And then at the end, then they win. Um, basic kind of stuff. Let's see here. Let's see what I missed. What are your thoughts on open office or libre office? They're fine. The thing is, is that I don't trust their formatting to be consistent for eBooks. So you might have to have a friend use Microsoft Word or something. I have an elevator pitch for my stuff already, Jedi High School, there you go. So Daniel Sandoval already has a great pitch. That's, that, that nails it, it's got, um, it's got the, you know, it's got genre, setting, space opera, space opera genre, Jedi in high school, Characters are high school dudes, but they're Jedi, right? So it's like Harry Potter, but Jedi, but space wizards. You can do it that way. Harry Potter, but in space. General story, and then you have some conflicts. Like, okay, the maybe the headmaster is really an alien. Who's turning, who's turning his select best students into dark Jedi, or whatever you're going to call them. And then the ending is they, they kill the headmaster and the, the bad students run away. Setting up book two. There you go. That's for free. Do you use mind maps? I don't know what that is, I don't think. I think I hear people talk about it. I don't think about it, so no. Would you consider watching and reviewing the John Wick series? I would consider it because people like it and it would draw attention to my channel. <laughs> it's a good idea. I might try writing a Western. Westerns are really cool. Um, I've written dramas, a horror thriller, and some science fiction. I wanna try something different. Uh, you catastrophe is a term invented by Tolkien. I don't remember it from Tolkien. It's generally defined as a turn of events at the end of the story, which ensures that the protagonist does not meet some terrible, impending, and very plausible and probable doom. So like Gollum biting off the finger. Yeah, a good catastrophe. Uh, epic fantasy usually takes quite a few pages, and the more I think about that, the more daunting I find the whole process. It depends what you're doing. Right, if you think of each subplot as a separate thing that you're composing, it's much less daunting than you think. So writing a 200,000 word novel is basically like writing two books or three books that are shorter. 
you're just mixing them up a little bit. Modern epic fantasy has a particular format that isn't as epic as you think it is. Um, it's just by using subplots, it, it thickens the texture of everything. So it's a thicker texture um, because there's more subplots. But you can always add more subplots. The difficult thing is, I think, keeping enough interest in all the different subplots throughout the book that the reader doesn't get lost or doesn't turn it off. Um, but it is. It's it's challenging to do that. Uh, but if you think about all the subplots as separate things that you're planning, it's much easier to, to handle. What if the best friend starts as a bully and a catalyst where the protagonist cast the spell to teleport the Winterfey realm and they have to now work together? That's good. That's kind of a, that's a good idea. I'm sure you've met many people like this, but how do you make the transition from coming up with a cool setting to coming up with a good story in that setting? The DM problem. I'm going to talk about that next week. So next week's going to get deeper into the planning the planning phase. Do you ever ask people for pull quotes? I don't know what that is. What are the best examples of flawed heroes you can think of? Thomas Covenant. Um, Luke Skywalker. Um, Han Solo is a flawed hero. Most heroes have good flaws. John McCain. Not John McCain. No. John McClane from Die Hard. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah. You must construct additional subplots. The most important element in any literary work is diversity. <laughs> okay. Okay. How do I describe mundane things from different time periods? A house in modern day isn't a house from 4,000 years ago. Should I spend time describing it or can I just say house? Describe it so that people know what they're, they're looking at. Is it a mud hut? Call it a mud hut. He walked into the adobe brick hut. He could, you know, he, he, what could he smell inside that would be different? He walked to one of the open windows and pulled back a hide flap to look out in the yard, right? So describe that probably better Tolkien said that you catastrophe was the ultimate function of fairy tales okay I don't remember this I don't remember this this writing tempted to write about royal pirates and mermaids do it why not so like pirate falls in love with the mermaid you know maybe he's a commissioned pirate like what you know what the English used to do back in back in the day <laughs> Um, and he falls in love with the mermaid, but you know, there's something to miss. Are classic fantasy heroic adventure plots like in Water of Awakening popular with readers or do they prefer more novelty in stories? Well, the classic is novelty now because of the, the cyclical nature of things. Because there's so few people writing adventure plots, the adventure is a novelty. What's the best way to put themes into your story? It depends on the theme. You have a plot that reflects it and everything else will fall into place. That's probably the correct answer. But see, for, for this particular course, I don't want you to think too heavily about these things. Let me, let me just take a second, and this is not a rant against anybody. Um, but one of the things I notice is I notice a lot of questions from people who've taken literature courses. We've all taken literature courses. These are literature course questions, themes. It's not what we're worried about. We're worried about the craft for this. Don't worry about, you know, I, I have philosophy in my books. I don't like to talk about themes even. It's like there's a very profound philosophy to this book. And I can explain it to you and I'll just tell you what it is, which is is history and memory accurate? And if you could rewrite memory, would you? And if memory has been rewritten, if history has been, re been rewritten, how would you know? It's very buried in there, but that's the purpose of what's going on. If you had the power to rewrite the story, would you? And if you did, have you actually rewritten it, even if everyone believes that you have? It's a weird, it's a weird couple ideas. I didn't, 
I didn't sit there and think about like I have a theme that I need to create a story for a vehicle for. It just went with the story. It was the correct theme to go with that story or whatever. It's the correct philosophy, correct thoughts. People ask questions that are really above what they really need to be thinking about when it comes to executing a story. No one gives a damn about a theme if they don't like the character setting and plot, period. If you're not executing the core elements of the story, it does not matter what your themes are. It doesn't matter what your philosophy is. It's extremely rare that good philosophy will ever make up for bad craft. The only example I can possibly think of is Atlas Shrugged. And Atlas Shrugged isn't even a bad book, but it's worse than it could have been if it had just been focused on story and not monologues. 1984 suffers, the story does not suffer at all for what's in it, for all of the philosophy that's in it. So a great story will communicate the philosophy better than starting with the theme. And this is not to rail against anyone. But it's like if I walk into a literature class, these are the kinds of questions that I would get from literature students. What do you think about this theme? What do you think about this prose element? What do you think about that? And it's like that none of that matters, guys. None of it matters. If you want to write books, you, you can think about that yourself and make your own interpretation when you write your own book. None of it matters. What matters is let's nail the craft. Let's get this book written. Let's get it out. Let's do create something meaningful and worthwhile for the world. Literature classes are focused entirely kind of inward in a way that is just not productive. So let's get out of the literature class mindset and get into a business mindset if we're going to write a book and we're going to make it good. So the core story elements, setting characters, plot. People, I've seen some great stuff about setting. Don't worry about theme. If the theme goes with your setting, it's an automatic thing. If I have a book set in first century Rome, what's the theme going to be? There's a bunch of themes that just arise naturally from that. Just pick one of those. Those are going to be in the book. If the characters are fully developed, if they're three-dimensional, if the plot's good, the themes are just in it. You know, it's kind of an automatic thing when you do when you do it really good. So always focus on the craft before you think about all that meta stuff. The meta stuff is it's not that it's worthless; it's very important, but it's not the focus of this, especially with the twenty thousand word book. You really want to just nail the craft and kick ass at writing a story that people like. Oh man, I love this character. Um, what's going to have people more excited about your book is saying, "Man, I love this character," rather than, um, you know, "Oh, he did such an interesting work with this theme." It's like the theme can be interesting, but people like Star Wars because they like Han Solo, not because of some grand philosophy. The philosophy is in it too, make no mistake. But if you ask people to talk about Star Wars, they'll start talking about characters. Characters are way more important. Is New Pulp a genre about characters in the vein of Doc Savage, The Shadow, Sam Spade, a financially profitable genre to write in? I think it is. But let's take a look at... Publisher Rocket. I don't think pulp is a genre on here. So it's hard for me to get, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I can get any any data on that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I can give you any data, but I think it'd be fine. Um, it could fit into other genres as well. I think people want just good stories. I feel like there's a real dearth of good stories, and that's that's why I talk about these things so much. Yeah, I yeah, Nitaku, I would write a story first and worry about the themes later, or the themes will be apparent as you're writing it, and you just kind of weave them in as as much as you think is possible. What are your thoughts on Neil Gaiman? I'm not interested in him or his work personally. <laughs> so I don't know what my thoughts are. I haven't read enough of him to say he's bad or good. He just doesn't do anything I'm remotely interested in. I'm not concerned with the theme at this moment. I kind of figured the theme will come out. Yeah, totally. I think so. Devil's in the details. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah, Lego Greens. Atlas Shrug can be explained up front without taking so many pages. It's twice as long as it needs to be, even with the themes intact. It's just too long a book. Um, she wants to. She wanted to write speeches, and she just put speeches into the books and wrote story around them. It's not the way to write a, a good book, but it's kind of the exception. You know, other people would write that, and no one would take notice of that. Thinking about a graveyard shift office janitor being stalked by a vampire, would that be too cliche? No, cliches are not bad. 
someone wants that. Maybe it's a girl vampire. Maybe they become friends. I can think of lots of lots of different kind of tense things with that. Would you be interested in directing a movie based on one of your books? That's beyond my technical knowledge. So probably not. And I, I, I don't really see myself being able to develop a bunch of filmmaking skills to actually do that. I'd rather write it and just have a really competent director do his interpretation. Like I'd rather write the screenplay. I'd like to write the screenplay if it was one of mine and then have a really competent director do his vision of it. Um, that's going to be better. It's going to produce a better product, I think. Because he's going to know more about cinematography, running a set. There's a million little skills that go into film production that I just don't know. I know how to write dialogue. <laughs> Story idea, an Anne Rand type character being hired to write for Hollywood today. So they all are writing for Hollywood, just they're the inversion of Anne Rand. <laughs> the inversion of her now i had this idea to have the fantasy of the story slowly be revealed over time what's the best way to confront this interesting so let's say there's a fantasy you you want to start by describing the mundane and then you want to show one fantasy element that makes the reader pause and go what right and that's going to be the first big point of interest and then you start from there, you continue on with describing mundane things until it's like, you know, he never trusted Jim because of Jim's orc blood. But what? There's orcs in this book? You know, and you go on with that. So little by little, just have a person engage in what you think is a normal set of activities, but there's one or two details that you just bring out. And that I think would work great. Are you familiar with um, maladaptive, well, hold on, let me move this, maladaptive daydreaming disorder? And if so, what do you think of it? Can it be useful for a writer who happens to have it? I don't know what it is, so let me Google it. <laughs> I don't know everything, guys. Maladaptive daydreaming. It's a psychiatric condition. <laughs> it's intense daydreaming that distracts a person from their real life. I might have this. <laughs> How about I have it? I don't know. I don't dissociate from reality. I for, I stop paying attention. I like filter out anything people are saying. You know, like my wife, I'll find my wife looking at me like her mouth is moving. I'm like, what? And she's like, I've been talking to you for like five minutes. I was like, sorry, I was zoned out. What were you thinking about? I was thinking about this dragon and this, <laughs> you know, I was imagining this. My son does it too. I'm just like, Roan. And he'd stop and look at me and be like, like what's up he's like there was a skeleton and then he's just like imagining things as he's like he'll stare at the wall and imagine crazy things uh but it's not like dissociative it's just me thinking thoughts so uh, maladaptive would be like you can't control it or it causes problems i guess i don't know i don't think it's a good thing if it causes problems in your life having a powerful imagination is a good thing though so I don't know. I don't probably don't know enough to, to lecture on that. I might have it. I do have one gripe here though with you trying to write uh, with trying to write something people want on the market because the past you've said you write books that you want. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I don't do this. I don't do this, but it's something that people can think of. So let's. It's a it's an optional thing. It's not something you have to do. You kind of want to know what genre you're in because that is going to guide a lot of your decisions for how you're going to find a cover artist. It's going to guide your decisions for choice of tints, choice of voice, style. It's going to guide a lot of what you're going to do, but you're right. I shouldn't tell people to do things that I don't myself do because I write the stories that I want to write. And if no one wants to read them, I don't care, right? I'm, I'm not so poor. You know, it's like, I would rather pick oranges to make money than write stories that I don't like. That's just me. James Montoya, any thoughts on the new Joker movie trailer? Haven't seen it. I don't watch trailers, but I'll watch it because you want to know about it. What's your favorite fairy tale? I like Bearskin. Bearskin, I think it was a Grimm's fairy tale. I don't, I came across this from a Japanese anime of Grimm's fairy tales that was broadcast here in the West like 20 or 30 years ago. 
probably 30 years ago at this point. And uh, it was a, it was a Japanese for a Japanese company made these Grimm's fairy tales and like there was a Western dub of them. I came across this one bearskin. I had to go look it up. This store, the, you know, this this soldier makes a deal with the devil to like be a be like a hobo for seven years and not pray to God or cut his nails, and he's you know he tries to do really good things and of course people judge him harshly. Of course, he also can like reach into his pocket and just pull out infinite amounts of gold. So he's actually like could be the richest person ever, but people won't people shun him because of his looks. He can't cut his hair. It's a very interesting, uh, very interesting fairy tale. I like it a lot. It has some great little themes about judging people, you know. And he, of course, eventually he wins. He wins the deal with the devil, and like gets the girl at the end. Um, how about the fan story going from low fantasy, but in reality it's high fantasy? part of world building well you just you describe things mundanely maybe broadly so you're like he left his house and walked down the street first thing people think of is their street then you can slowly start giving getting details that reveal to you that it's actually like a final fantasy 9 high setting you know high fantasy setting rather than something different like i, I bring that one up because it's like it has all these fantasy elements and as you go through the game they keep revealing more of them it's like there's airships there's bugs carrying there's bug trams there's like machines what so as you go through it like it's not just a medieval fantasy at all it's something crazier um and that's kind of cool so you can do that uh maladaptive daydreaming disorder was the focus of the secret life of walter mitty i don't remember secret life of walter mitty i remember it existing i think i watched it but i don't remember it Everyone is making idea pitches at you in here in mind. Macbeth in space. Okay, let's talk about this. Let's talk about synthesis for a minute. Because this is another important thing. So this is something that you can think about if you're having trouble beginning like with a place. So let's talk about synthesis. Synthesis. All right. So synthesis in this context. Synthesis doesn't mean creating something entirely original. It means recreating something or making something synthetic. You're doing something artificial. But in this context, what synthesis is, is creating something new by combining two other things. So when you're, when you're working with a music synthesizer, you are trying to, in a lot of cases, you're trying to create a new sound by combining different waveforms. So you're modulating a triangle wave with a square wave and it produces a weird set of overtones when you're doing FM synthesis. That's exactly what it is. You're combining two waveforms to produce a unique outcome. In some cases, you, you could be trying to recreate like a clarinet sound. In other cases, you're trying to create something new. So if you're gonna do synthesis, this is a really, really great place to start with thinking of a story. This is an easy way to explain something to somebody because you, you create, you just combine two Familiar elements and something very unfamiliar comes out. So it's like, you know, Harry Potter. In space, right? So it's Jedi Academy, right? But that's how you might describe it. It's Harry Potter in space. Jedi Academy, you could think Harry Potter is just Jedi Academy, but medieval, right um there's a bunch of ways to to see that like when you when you combine these two things you get it star wars what is star wars star wars is um star trek plus you know the pulp plus like flash gordon maybe plus john carter John Carter of Mars, right? Or it's Star Trek plus Michael Moorcock, right? It's Star Trek plus Elric. Let's just cross that out. Star Trek plus Elric. Darth Vader is Elric in space. There you go. So when you're when you're thinking of an idea, what you want to think of is something that's familiar and you're 
you're adding to it something that's very unfamiliar within that context. And this is actually a really, really good key towards creating not th things that can seem extremely original on their own, even though we're, we're starting with the synthesis idea. People didn't know Harry Potter was going to was going to explode. So what is what is Harry Potter? Harry Potter is Earthsea, but urban fantasy. So it's the first Earthsea book with the Mage College, but in in modern England. That's Harry Potter. It's a basic synthetic idea. But what comes out of it can be very original, very compelling things that people really like. Um, so lots of people like Harry Potter. Twilight, I say I have a Twilight book somewhere. Twilight is vampires at your high school, right? Um, it's lost boys, but romance. Um, what's another one? You know, you could think of all of these things. So uh, you could combine, let's say it's like, man, I really want to work in, in fantasy, right? I want to write a fantasy novel. So for, for my project with this, I'll probably write something that's fantasy. So maybe it's fantasy except fairy. That's Water of Awakening. It's a it's the Hobbit, but a fairy tale. But like full on crazy fairy magic with platonic philosophy. <laughs> um, so it, it kind of starts from a synthetic idea, but a lot of originality can come out of that. It's very rare to create something that's totally original. You could think biker mice from Mars, right? Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. These are all synthetic ideas. Robot Pirate Ninja Force. Um, elves in Space. Well, now we're doing Warhammer 40K, right? Um, you could do... What if ogres are a smart? I don't know. Um, gods who forgot they were gods. Now you're doing that Will Smith movie. People think they're superheroes, but it's really gods who like have lost their power, right? Um, I don't know. I'm, I can't think of too many others, but this is a great place to begin is with the synthetic idea and um, starting with the genre that you want. So here's the way to do to do that. I probably say start with a genre or setting. and add a new element. Crusaders in space. Um, Conan, but in space, I don't know what's in. <laughs> Interdimensional Conan. Um, angels, but they I don't know. Well, I can't think of one of the angels. <laughs> angels in the Stone Age. You know, you can get lots of stuff from that. So synthesis is a great place to start, and that's probably where I'd start over the next over the next few um, days to think about an idea that you can actually execute in twenty thousand words. So to execute something in twenty thousand words, going back to this uh, ABC plot thing. So for ours, we're we're going to be doing. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mr. Beat the Boop. We're gonna do A story only. And we're gonna keep the plot elements really, really tight so that you can actually tell an A story. It's gonna mostly be conflict, a midpoint, and a resolution. And I'll describe how to do that next week. I'll have some information for there. Let's see here. Uh, do you know of any books that use Celtic, um, see the Fey mythology as influence? Mine. Uh, the only one that comes to mind recently is Butcher's Dresden Files. Water of Awakening does. You can read it. You can get it for free if you're on my list. Yeah. Um, Tolkien wrote several fairy stories that are in that uh, in that vein. Um, I'm having trouble thinking off the top of my head of too many. There's obviously the, uh, the Chronicles of Pridane. Pridane which the Disney movie The Black Cauldron is based off of. Absolutely, that uses Celtic and Fey mythology. So you can, I would actually recommend that one. It's a great uh, children's book series and very influential. 
Uh, Hardwick, do you think that waiting until the end of a book or movie to reveal a fantasy or science fiction idea is a bad idea? It took me out of the prestige, which I enjoyed until the end. I do think it's a bad idea. So the prestige had this thing where like the machine really, like the magic was real at the end. The machine really did what it was supposed to do at the end. Now, I like that. But in a lot of cases, it doesn't work. Um, it really depends how you do it. So it's kind of like the matrix reveal, but at the end, you know, at the end of the thing instead of at the beginning. And so it can really upset, uh, it can upset a viewer because they're not feeling like they're getting the resolution that they deserve. But I like the prestige. I like I liked that reveal. Usually I think it's, it's not a good idea because it's just hard to pull off. I think there's other people that do it. It's like at the end, it turns out he was a ghost the whole time. You know, we remember the movies that do it, but we also don't remember the movies that don't do it well. <laughs> What's the best time or the best way to reveal certain information like secrets that some characters have? Hard to say. So uh, a reveal, there's different things that qualify as plot points. An event that changes the trajectory of the story, which makes the characters change their plans. Or a, re a revelation. So in that case, a secret is a revelation. So um, anytime you need the characters to change what they're doing, you can reveal a secret. That's the best time to do it. If you do it at another time, it's it's not going to feel as impactful as when it's actually going to matter. So maybe the characters overcome with guilt, they have to reveal a secret, and then, oh no, you, you did, I wish you would have told us this because now we have to do things differently. You know, that's that's when you want it. Would what if Cinderella's fairy godmother was actually Cthulhu be a good synthesis? Absolutely. So her fairy godmother is, she thinks is benevolent, but it turns out she's like actually really evil. And it turns out Cinderella's wishes for things became like a crazy perverted fantasy that caused madness and chaos. That would be great. I would like that. That's a, That sounds like a good, it sounds like fairy horror. I like it. Um, uh, what... Uh, what is it that deconstructions have become so common in books and film these days? I see them everywhere now. Um, just to go over it in a short way, when I say artistic deconstruction, I had some, some, somebody on like one of the comments is like, you're talking about, it's like deconstruction means this. And they're talking about deconstructive analysis. I'm like, I know what deconstructive analysis is. You know, I know what that is. That's not what I'm talking about. Everybody in chat knows we're talking about artistic deconstruction. Why do I think it's popular? I think it's popular because of two weird things that interact. First of all, people are not as creative. The other one is that there's a contempt for culture. So you have filmmakers that have a contempt for the culture that raised them. A lot of Generation X type, very cynical people. They don't like fairy tales because their life exists without hope. Uh, they don't like stories about heroes because heroes make them feel bad about themselves. So they attempt to deconstruct this stuff. You also have a problem with the Academy where the Academy hasn't taught good storytelling practices in like 100 years. They've just focused on things that don't matter. Like, I don't know, a bunch of things that don't matter. Like, I don't know, tiny little prose elements that just don't matter. It's like, James Joyce did this in this chapter. It's like, what's this story about? Oh, it's just the Odyssey. Okay. <laughs> you know, we haven't really talked about stuff that matters in like 100 years as far as how to write books. So it's just a popular thing. I think people have a contempt for culture and they're also just not that original. So it makes it an easy dunk. Let me just, let me just take something that's there and dunk on it. The other thing is, especially with Hollywood, Hollywood's very risk averse because it costs so much to produce things. So they want things in these established genres that have existed a million times before. But at the same time, you have to do something original that just leaves you deconstructing what came before. Problem is you can only do that one time. You only deconstruct the fantasy genre one time before you you are no longer deconstructing fantasy. You're just operating in a new genre, right? You know, if you're deconstructing superheroes, it's kind of like The Boys. People are like, The Boys isn't a deconstruction. It's like, it probably isn't because it's just, that's just the genre now. Superheroes that are no longer virtuous. 
That's just the, the way the, the genre is now. Once you deconstructed it, it's just the new norm. After Watchmen, you just get superheroes are no longer uh, emblems of virtue. They're no longer heroes. They are people who happen to have powers and don't act like heroes. It just became a different genre. After you deconstruct it once, you're no longer operating with those tropes in mind. The new trope is superheroes are just flawed people and aren't really heroes. They're just people with powers. That's the new trope. So if you deconstructed that trope, it would be there'd be one guy who's really virtuous and actually does the right thing over and over again, and all of the superheroes turn on him, and it becomes one hero against the entire world of superheroes because they hate him for being good. That would be the deconstruction. And it would be good. It would be a necessary deconstruction. So deconstructions are not always bad either. Sometimes they're really good. Um, when I try to world build space fantasy, it ends up feeling like Frank Herbert's Dune. It's because Frank Herbert's Dune's really good. You know, maybe that's actually Star Wars is Star Trek meets Dune. Are you a believer in the concept of headcanon? Yes, but it doesn't matter. My whole thing is like, if the original artist didn't write it, it can't be canon. So you can decide whatever you want to, to like. I'm okay with that. Sammy says, do you think there's any room left for a new unique genre to be made in the next decade or so? Absolutely. It might happen through uh, synthesis, though. Mike, what is uh, what is lit RPG? It's um, fantasy, but d d It's a synthesis idea. It's actually not that original. Terrapar, I'm tuning in late, but I'm going to try to catch up. If I don't make it before it's over, thanks again for the streams. You're welcome. Uh, enjoy watching them anyway. If one's really desperate for an idea, they could look at the the title of any Vice video and adapt that into science fiction. This tra- tra- transgender Aztec child gangs cannibals. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that would be funny. Uh, cannibals in space, right? Remember, I can imagine people that, like, the resources are so tight they resort to cannibalism, um, like in space. We talked about synthesis. Where's my homework page? All right, yeah, so you're going to think about the genre setting. You can imagine some characters, and you're going to think about general story stuff. Um, so that part of that can be part of, you know, your synthesis idea. Next week we'll talk about how to write up some basic character traits, how to write up an event sequence, how to structure your plot, and then go from broad stuff down to the details. Let's see here. Are any of your dreams lucid? Sometimes. And do you think that lucid dreaming is dangerous? No. I don't see why it would be. Star Wars also had uh, Akira Kurosawa films uh, influenced into it. Yes, true. Have you seen Big Trouble in Little China? Yes. If so, what are your thoughts? I liked it. I haven't seen it in a long time, though. So I'm not sure if I could like wax poetic on it. It's probably been 20 years. I feel like old Doctor Who did some mashup sci-fi and mystery. Yeah, that's actually a good point. I don't watch a lot of Doctor Who. It's not really for me, but um, yeah, that, that could be that. They used to do mystery mashups in like Star Trek too. So Star Trek would do the synthesis stuff every week, you know. Oh, oh, let's have them have a mystery detective in the holodeck, but if something goes wrong and they have to escape, you know. That's that's the way that they create a lot of the stories. They encounter an alien species that's like this, but this. So synthesis is this idea, but this. The aliens are uh, have a have a utopia, but anytime you break the law, you get killed. Um the aliens are beautiful, but they're also, they die when they're seven years old. You know, the aliens uh, are are Nazis, but the society runs really well and we don't know how to deal with that. <laughs> um, it makes me swell with pride knowing that somebody else loves Lloyd Alexander's pretty in series. Island We and Fluter would be happy. I'm going to do a thing on uh, Black Cauldron. Uh, my son really likes those books too. Uh, I'm going to do something on the Black Black Cauldron movie. It's an interesting movie to look at. It's so, from a just a, a writing perspective, it's what happens when you throw a bunch of writers at the wall and you're like, turn this series into a book. And they're like, oh, and they don't know where, where to begin with it. <laughs> there's, so, there's too much stuff in it and it feels like almost schizophrenic at times. <laughs> How do you pronounce um, Finglui, uh, Miglunafa, Cthulhu, uh, Relea, Wogenagel, Fathagen. I don't know, like that. 
Anyone with chronic sleep issues who finds it hard to stay focused and motivated while being creative. Short bursts, maybe. When I'm tired, if I can focus for 10 minutes at a time and then release that focus, that helps me. But uh, because I don't... I wouldn't say I have chronic sleep issues. I don't sleep as much as other people, but it doesn't doesn't harm me as much. I think I'm a little bit resistant to sleep deprivation. That might be my like superhero power. Is like I can not sleep and be okay for a couple of days. People are very cynical in today's world. I agree. I think that's part of the deconstruction thing. Off topic. How do I kill a wurtla? We're gonna have to figure that out, aren't we? Because obviously the angels that imprisoned them couldn't kill them. That's why they imprisoned them. So if they can't be killed, or if they're like the old ones, that death it doesn't isn't really death for them, how do you get rid of them? How do you imprison them? So that's going to have to be a solution that our heroes are going to have to look for in the future. In your last stream, you implied a negative view of Ulysses and a positive one of, oh, brother, where art thou? Yeah, they're both there. Um, what differentiates them in your view? Oh, oh, okay. So I don't have necessarily a negative view of Ulysses. I like it for what it is, which is a, a stylistic exercise. So where, oh brother, where art thou? The big advantage of that over Ulysses is that it's a two-hour movie, so you're done with it after two hours. And oh brother, where art thou actually has like more humor in it. I probably I miss a lot of the humor of Ulysses because I'm so time separated from it. I think there's some humorous stuff that's intended in it. It just, you know, it's not a book from my time or space. So it, it's a little bit out of time. You miss a lot of humor that way. But I don't think, Oh Brother, Where Out Thou is like a great movie. It's not my favorite movie. It is just the Odyssey. It's just a retelling of it um, for the same reason. But it's not like, it's not done in a way that's just there to demonstrate technique. It's just a telling of the story in a different setting. And they try to do a really good job telling the story. Um, so that's probably what, what differentiates them. They're just really trying to tell the story well. And oh, brother, we're out though. Whereas James Joyce is not trying to tell the story well at all. That's not his goal. His motivation is not remotely to convey the story well. It's to, it's to show off certain technical things, in my opinion. What if you deconstruct a post-deconstruction genre by returning it to the former setting? There you go. You could do that. That's what um, Water of Awakening is in a way, you know? It's really not a deconstruction of a deconstruction. It's just the correct correct setting. Sammy says, Lovecraft plus Dragon Ball Z, Steampunk plus Arabian Nights. You could do Steampunk and Arabian Nights. You're flying your airship through the desert. Uh, Moby Dick plus Space Opera. You're in space hunting an alien, a giant alien, and the giant alien destroyed your spaceship. There you go. Westerns plus Flash Gordon. Cowboys versus aliens. Gundam plus slapstick. That's going to be an execution thing. Kiju plus mage college. Most of those are probably horrible, uh, but there you go. I don't know what Kiju is. Do you mean Kaiju? I, lo I would love Godzilla plus mage college. The mages are there to blow up Godzilla. Um, do you use Wor World Anvil or any websites like that to help with world building and organizing? I do not. I use Word document. I use Word document. For every book I write, I have a that book notes, and it's just a bunch of random information. Otherwise, it's all up here. Uh, Crazy Chameleon. The boys does have one person who genuinely wants to be a hero in the group, but every other hero in that group is a sellout. There you go. See, that's a good little variation. See, and then they're deconstructing the deconstruction, and then I kind of want to watch it more. But um, Do you find that lack of REM sleep has a negative effect on one's creativity? I don't know. I have tons of REM sleep as far as I know. So I don't know. Oh God, you just summoned Cthulhu. Why? Because I hate all of you. Me and the Dark One, Cthulhu. I think the Black Cauldron trilogy is due to be made soon. I think Disney are going to give it another shot, but in live action form. I did enjoy the animated film though. I think it's actually, stylistically, it's one of their best animated films. Um, but it, in terms of them trying, they tried to do too much with the plot and they didn't know what they were doing. I think I'll try cyberpunk plus magic. We call that mana punk. So mana punk is what you're looking for. Mana punk. 
Yeah. Um, actually, no, Mana Punk is something else. Mana Punk is Steampunk with Mana. What is Mana Punk? Cyberpunk plus Magic is Shadowrun. Um, Star Trek First Contact had elements of Moby Dick in space. Absolutely. They even, they even made that reference. And then uh, Picard starts quoting it. And then she, the girl who's with him says, I never read it. <laughs> I never read the book. Black Cauldron is my favorite Disney movie because it had no musical numbers. That's right. It didn't. It had a fantasy score like Conan. It was great. It was a cool movie in so many ways. Um, apparently, it like almost sunk Disney animation studios, though. Another way to approach synthesis is to take a bunch of things that you love and combine them. Absolutely. Um, George Egerog. Some of my favorite books are humorous like Discworld and Hitchhiker's Guide. Any advice on writing humor? It's all in the execution, I think. It's all in the execution. I do like uh, the idea of Discworld and Hitchhiker's Guide is funny. Did you know that Black Cauldron was edited down for its rating? I do know that. The original cut was much scarier and had people with their skin melting off. Disney went a little crazy. I also heard an early an early animated section of it had um, Ilanwi like slightly nude, like escaping naked and having to put on clothes or something. Um, and they, they edited that out because obviously nudity is even scarier than people melting. Uh, I think they tried to fit the first two books into one film. Yeah, that's kind of what they did. So you have, you have um, Taryn or... Taran, he gets captured, but instead of Spiral Castle, it's Aran's castle. Instead of Aran, it's the Horned King. And then he meets Alanwi there, like in the first book, but then they have to go get the Black Cauldron and destroy it by crawling into it. Yeah, it's too much. They should have just picked the first book, Book of Three. Uh, it is four in the morning. I stay it because I saw this stream, but my eyes are heavy. Good night, everyone. Uh, yep, good night. It's almost time for the stream to end. We've got about 15 more minutes. Let me ask you, is there anything else that you want advice on for the next week to think about this? We're planning our, oh, here's some, I'll just give you some tips while you guys are thinking about any additional questions. Um, let me think. Okay, so here's my here's my general, my general tips. When you're beginning the drafting phase, so first of all, for the planning phase, there's no, there's nothing that you need to worry about with time. Do planning in as much free time as you have until you're done with it. For the drafting phase, here's what I want you to think about. Take one day, so day one, uh, time your uh, 1,000 words, 1K words. And however much time it took you to write that 1,000 words on the first day, you need to make that much time available every day during your drafting process. So if it's two hours to write that 1,000 words, you need to set aside two hours a day. Now the thing is you might get faster and better as you go. It's better to finish early than to finish late though. So always try to budget that amount of time. I like to focus on a word count goal because that way you are not, rather than saying I'm gonna write two hours a day because we have a goal to finish. We need to finish at least a 20,000 word book. So that means you got to be writing a thousand words a day, minimum. Uh, and if you do more than that, great. And if you go over that, then maybe you can give yourself a day off if you absolutely need it. But set aside uh, the time to do a thousand words. If it's two hours, if it's four hours, whatever it's got to be, get it done. You'll get better as you go too. The more you iterate, the more you do this, the better you get. Um, Sammy says, I have an idea I'd like to make into a superhero comic. The world is a deconstructed superhero universe, but the main hero still uh, stays valorful despite all the darkness. Yeah, I like that. He has to fight the whole world. He's fighting the whole world like a Man of War album. Black Cauldron was better than Frozen. I think so. I think Frozen was way overrated. I don't think it was very good, personally. But it was okay. It was just really schizophrenic. Uh, how heavily do you think media impacts our view of history? Heavily. I can't tell you how many people I have encountered who think the Braveheart, that Braveheart is historically accurate. So I think, yes, it heavily does. And there's two elements there. You mentioned Braveheart. Braveheart, the screenwriter himself said he wasn't trying to write anything historically accurate. He was just writing according to the feelings he had about William Wallace. So the feelings that we have attached to historical events are very important. 
They are as important as the facts. In fact, so much so that people will twist the facts to meet their feelings, right? Um, you know, the American Revolution, uh, what's it all about? It's about freedom and this and that. And it's like, can you, can you really say it's completely about freedom when half of the states that rebelled, half of the colonies that rebelled, had institutionalized human slavery? No, I think it has more to do with a people that were culturally and economically, uh, they were culturally different than those who were lords over them. They were not economically or politically empowered and were in a disadvantageous position that they wished to correct. Uh, would be a more historically accurate way of looking at the American Revolution rather than saying it's purely about freedom. Liberty is part of that because you don't have political freedom there. No taxation without representation. But it can't be completely about liberty unless you acknowledge, and, and while you have to acknowledge that like a huge portion of people that were rebelling had institutionalized human slavery. So clearly that liberty did not ex extend to everyone. It just extended to uh, a select group of people there, right? Um, and if you're going to think I'm super like unpatriotic for saying something like that, that only proves my point. We have these feelings that are instilled with us that are repeated over and over again through stories, um, media exposure, various things color our view of the past in a way that is beyond the facts. And in a lot of cases, our history is so incomplete, it's impossible to have an accurate view of what happened. You're reading what the victor said about a particular conflict and not maybe what was really there, why people were in it, how people felt about it. You view it through a modern lens. Of course, you look at Braveheart and you start attaching to it a bunch of modern ideas that I don't know what the Scots in the 13th century felt about William Wallace or the King of England or anyone else. I don't know exactly how they felt. We're kind of starting with how we feel and thinking about how that might be similar and how we would feel about certain things, you know. So the feelings that are attached to Braveheart, I think, are part of that big color. I'm not going to say that they're bad feelings, but they do make the English particularly vicious in, um, in Braveheart in a way that is probably not fair to the English of that time. Um, a whole bunch of things. They also wear their kilts backwards. Fun fact. They're wearing belted plaid backwards 100 years before anyone wore belted plaid. What do you think the chances of a live action Black Cauldron being good? I'm inclined to believe that they'll try to wokeify it like they did with The Wrinkle in Time. I didn't watch The Wrinkle in Time, but yeah, you're probably right. Um, I'm great at coming up with ideas, characters, and scenes for a story, but terrible at figuring out how to arrange them into a coherent plot. Any advice on how to remedy this? I'll go into detail on it next week. Think big. First of all, conflict and ending. Then you think of the stuff in between. So the book can be as long or as short as you want by increasing or decreasing the amount of plot points that occur between the beginning and the end. So when you're setting up your beginning and your end, um, you can have as many plot points as you want. It's like we need to throw the ring of power into fire to destroy it. Now, what happens between the beginning and the end could be as long or as short as you want it to be. Depends. So you could have them fly an eagle to Mordor and throw the ring in and it's over in 5,000 words. Or you could have them have an epic journey with many setbacks, many dangers, many very close calls, and then all of a sudden you have an epic plot. So the amount of space you put between the beginning and the ending is what determines the length of the plot. So when you're writing epic fantasy, you just put a bunch of crap in the middle, right? You put a bunch of things that change the trajectory of what they're doing, make the characters rethink their actions, make the characters fail, make them have to gain new power, all those things go in between the beginning and the end. So as long as you know the beginning and the end, you can create the plot. You are you can create a plot. There's nothing to stop you from doing it. Um, but you have to know the ending. So if you don't know the ending and you don't know the beginning, you're at a disadvantage. But if you know the be beginning, you know the ending, I can give you a bunch of tips for how to make it as long or as short as you want it to be. Uh, how do you go about putting up a certain writing, putting a certain writing style into a book or story? I'll talk about that next week. Um, it has to do with what genre it's in, what you want that style to convey, what kind of style the reader wants, you know, a bunch of things. Frozen was all right. It's not as great as people say it is. I think it is one of the most overrated films of this decade. I agree, Jared. 
Uh, do you have plans to discuss the newest Star Wars trailer? I, I guess I will. People are asking me to, so I'll look at it. I think Star Wars is dead, but you know, so I'll, I'll take the take the bail off. Uh, it'll get clicks, and so if it gets clicks, that attracts more people to my channel, which attracts more people to what I'm doing. So they'll stay for the things which I actually think are positive. Um, if you're gonna harp on me for doing negative content for like crapping on Star Wars and not you know, I do more work, whoops, I do more work than almost anyone I can think of towards creating new stuff and exposing other people's new stuff as well. And that's what the new stream, after this is done, three weeks out of the month, it's going to be entirely talking about other things. You know, I'm committed to that, but I got to get somebody's attention in order to direct them towards that. So that means talking about what they already know, like talking about Star Wars, talking about Star Trek, other things people like, Lord of the Rings. I I mean, I really should watch Game of Thrones because people want to talk about it. Maybe I should have watched it from the beginning. I just don't like it. So it's boring for me to watch it, and I just don't want to watch it. So i got to draw the line somewhere. But it would attract people to my channel, I, and then it'd be, it'd be like a slam dunk. Here's some content on Game of Thrones. Here's me talking about Game of Thrones. Buy my fantasy book. I don't know. I, I got to draw a line somewhere. <laughs> I'm writing a story currently where the universe was created by a demon. Humans worship the demon as a benevolent god. Unknown to them is he's feasting on their souls. So that is a Gnostic. That's a form of Gnosticism. So the Gnostic belief, ancient Gnostic belief, I mean, this is one form of Gnosticism. The world was created by the Demiurge, who was a basically a being hidden from the actual god and archons uh, and his world is created imperfectly because he's never had full exposure to the concept realm and so the god that people worship like from the bible is actually a perverted anti-god that essentially is hiding the true nature of the concept realm beyond our imperfect and strangely defined realm um there you go it's it's gnostic do you have any plans to discuss the newest star wars yes okay i'd be interested in you seeing your reaction to the cats trailer oh god oh god i saw it i should do it it looks really creepy to me it looks like furry porn dude and uh, not like it looks like furry porn live action furry porn like i'm about to see genitals and stuff. It's really weird to me. I I was very off put by it. Without George Lucas, it's not real Star Wars. I agree. <laughs> Game of Thrones is basic bitch fantasy and softcore porn. It's barely fantasy. Its fantasy elements are very light. I call it soap opera. It, the book is like a soap opera. I read the first book 15 years ago, probably. And I thought it was a lot like a soap opera. It was okay, but I didn't continue. Um, I think there were only like two or three books at that time. Um, but if you like so if you like the darker elements of Game of Thrones read Black Company by Glenn Cook instead um, that's a, just much better I mean there's just a lot better fantasy out there I think that's not that's not this kind of going all over the place soap opera no plot movement kind of stuff maybe ha having a video on how Star Wars could have been better while getting uh, while negative in tone, it serves the purpose. Yeah, you could do that. Um, I can understand not wanting to focus on negativity all the time, but I do think you do a great job breaking down. Thank you. So, like I said, you you do a negative right now. Here's my here's my um, my setup. And in fact, if you're gonna do a content focused marketing strategy over the long run, whether you're doing this on a blog or you're doing this. YouTube videos, negativity is the most anti-fragile and potent thing. It's going to get the most views. It's going to attract the most clicks. It will also attract the most hatred. It'll attract the most death threats. It'll attract the most um, really kind of bad stuff. The stuff, trust me, like it's um, it sucks when you have people on the internet who hate you and want you dead, right? Because you happen to explain why Star Wars sucked or something else sucked, right? So it attracts by far the most negativity, but it also attracts the most attention. So 
you have to actually play a balance and this is what I do. So I do I do a hot take, at least one hot take every week now. And then the rest of the time it's content that's focused on things that I think are more positive and fun. Let me talk about this book I like. Let me um, let me share with you a book you might not have read. Let me review a record. Let me talk about writing. Let's just talk philosophy. Let's just talk about something cool from something that we like. Um, let me do a content ex- explaining some story element that I thought was really cool. And uh, then what that happens is you attract attention. People get sucked into your content stream. Then maybe they subscribe. Then they watch the stuff that makes them feel good. And that gives a positive reinforcement. I agree with you with the negative stuff. And then eventually there's going to be a hot take that makes them mad, like the Spider-Man thing. And half the people who follow my channel like loved this Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. I did not like it. I didn't hate it. But it was, I've rated it pretty pretty damn low. And so a lot of people got upset. But not too many people were unsubscribing because they didn't agree with my takedown of, of Spider-Man. Because the, uh, the other content is good enough that they're that they like it. You don't have to agree with me on everything. Or when I say something's good and they don't like it, it that usually doesn't upset them enough to make make them unsubscribe. Sometimes it does. Like when I gave a positive review to Black Panther, which I think was a well-made movie, I had a I had a bunch of people that are like, I'm unsubscribing. It's like, why are you watching a bunch of movies you hate? You know? Why are you going to the movies every week to watch movies you don't like? I don't understand it. <laughs> yeah, sometimes there's bad movies that we need to, to bitch about. But other times, we should talk about things we like. Who needs Star Wars? We have Star Wars Legos. Lego Star Wars is more Star Wars than Star Wars now. It really is. Using the stories about George Lucas wrote would be a good start. Yes. So when thinking of characters, it's best to have two to three main characters. Very good question. You want to have one to two main characters, usually one that's like primary and one that's secondary. So you have like the main character and the best friend or the main character and the love interest. And those are going to kind of go together. And then a bunch of auxiliary characters, usually one major supporting character, one major antagonist. And then the rest of them are support, comedic relief, static characters, foils, things like that. So just as an example, let's use Star Wars because people love Star Wars. The main character is Luke. The main secondary character is actually Leia. The main support character is Han Solo, and then everybody else is playing support. Obi-Wan is playing the, playing. he's only in half the movie, you know. Um, the droids are comic relief, Chewie's comic relief. And then you have one main antagonist, Darth Vader. If you look at Muramasa, okay. Main character is Taoka Yoshio, right? Um, secondary character is uh, Asano Amaya and so those are the two main characters and eventually they do become like a love interest you know with each other um, but then the rest of them there's a main support character Muramasa himself main antagonist uh, Ryo Nusuke who's like the main bad guy in this uh, so it, it fits that bill if you look at Needle Ash so I'm telling you the things I do Right, as Lego Greens would point out, I should tell you what I do. Needle Ash. Here's, you know, I I just have representations of the main characters. You know, here's a you know the main protagonist, Michael. Then you have his main best friend slash love interest, Sharona. You have his main support characters. Uh, in fact, I'm trying to think who who would qualify as a main support character. Probably Angelico. Um, but it really, in one main antagonist, which is actually his brother, Johan, uh, but then their secondary antagonist supports foils, uh, guys like Thokar that show up halfway through the narrative to kind of power everybody through the final act, through the final volume. Um, I follow this pretty, pretty bang on the money. Now, Water of Awakening is weird because I really wanted it to be about one, one, one hero's journey. So the main character is Helga. The main support character is actually the group of three ravens and their comic relief as well uh, but they provide like the main source of companionship for her through most of the journey um, and then you have a bunch of other secondary ones that come around so this one is really different in that there's one main character and there's not 
really an antagonist. There's a series of antagonists depending on where she's at. This is much different. This is a way different constructed book than what I normally do and what people normally read. And this this is why people either hate it or they love it because it's so different from what they normally read or it's, you know, it's so different from what they normally read. Um, same thing with, uh, I'm sure there's people who are gonna hate Voices of the Void. This one has one main protagonist, one main secondary character. That's just a little bit lower, right? Um, I know that people have mentioned the John Wick movies to you, but I thought it might be interesting to know that the third one features the man defying the gods mythological idea. I love that idea. It's very Greek. It's very Odyssean. What goes into making a good ending? Wow, what a great question. The ending should resolve the conflict. That is a good ending. If the conflict is we got to blow up the Death Star, the ending's got to be blowing up the Death Star or everybody else dying. Right? That's a good ending. Now, someone could die to do it. Someone could not die to do it. It depends. If you want an ending where the, the hero sacrifices himself to make the audience cry, you have the hero die to accomplish his goal. If you just want to accomplish the goal and have everybody right off into the sunset, you have them not die. The main thing is you got to resolve the conflict. That's a good ending. As long as you're doing that, you're doing good. This is why a lot of Stephen King books are not good. They don't have an ending. The ending doesn't resolve the conflict because he didn't know what the ending would be when he started writing the book. And so he just kind of tries to tie things off at the end. Right. Um, so, yeah, knowing just something that resolves the main sense of tension. You know, uh, Helga cures her husband. <laughs> uh I also like to make videos about movies I like more. Yeah, it's more fun to talk about things you love. It's more more passionate and fun. Have you seen Barton Fink? Great breakdown of the hack writer's process. I haven't. But I've read Save the Cat, which is a hack writer's process. Uh, <laughs> didn't finish my comment. Basically, I have a protagonist. Uh, what's your thoughts on Jay Kristoff's Overnight series? Never Night series. I haven't read it, but... Uh, maybe I'll put it on the list. I, I haven't read it, so sorry. When a character is going to die in the story, what are some things to avoid as not to upset the audience? I don't think, I think the point is to upset the audience, but it depends what you want them to feel with that upset. Do you want them to cry that the character died or do you want them to be angry at you for killing them? Those are two different feelings. So if you want them to be sad that the character dies, the character's death needs to have some sort of meaning in the broader sense of things. It needs to not be senseless. Uh, if you want the audience to be mad at you, you have the character do something evil and then die. That's like disrupting their memory or have them get killed for no reason. Uh, so if the, if the death has proper meaning, then people will cry about the character dying, not be mad at you for killing them. Um, when writing stories that take place in the past, how should one deal with social norms from them like incestuous marriages, polygamy, etc.? Is it okay to treat them as normal uh, if it was? That's what I do. So that's what I do. Um, but remember that you're writing for a, a, a modern audience. Here it is. Prophet of the God Seed. Um, one of the cultures in Prophet of the God Seed engages in polygamous marriage due to high mortality of the male population due to like an ongoing forever war. Now, polygamy by itself, historically, it's not that uncommon. I mean, um, what we should call polygamous, many, many women marrying one man. I'm not sure if there, I think there's a more technical term for women and men. Um, but I, I know that the modern person reading this is, in, is reading it in a monogamous time. So when they read the polygamous aspects, they're going to be slightly titillated by those. And knowing that they'd be slightly titillated by that, though I, this world building has a purpose in the, in the broader part of this book, though I knew they'd be slightly titillated by that, I decided to add a little subplot that was um, basically a son of a powerful lord having an affair with one of his father's wives, which is very titillating. It's gonna be really weird to a modern person and they're gonna pay attention to it and, and really react to it. 
So I think you 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 have to keep in mind the audience to a certain extent. The characters need to act as though it's normal, but obviously the, the audience is not going to view it that way. So you can have a lot of fun with them having kind of titillating things. Polygamous acts. I know George R. R. Martin loves incest for whatever reason. I don't think incest was quite as common as people think. There's incest generally people don't do incest. There's a psychological term for it, but if you grow up with somebody in close contact with them, you're not sexually attracted to them. Why people don't think their sisters are hot. They may look at their sister and be like, I know she has the elements of a pretty girl, but I'm not attracted to her. Um, I don't remember what it's called. One of you guys will probably remember. So yeah, I, I, I would keep it in mind and titillate people with it. That's why people like Game of Thrones. It's very titillating. Are cliffhangers a bad idea for shorter books and stories? In general, yes, except in this case. So the, so the shorter story has a part two that you'd like to sell. Then yeah, so the part one ends with a cliffhanger. Part two, which people want to buy part two. They're going to want to buy it if you end with a cliffhanger. They might be angry at you for ending with a cliffhanger, but will their anger be greater than their desire to see the outcome of the story and buy book, book number two? If it's part of a series, it's fine. What level of super chat would get you to watch Barton Fink with the, the next 30 days? And or read Blood Meridian, which is a Gnostic Western. I don't know. Um, you can make them mad at the villain for killing that character. Yep. I agree that Frozen is overrated. I think that Cinderella 2015 is the best recent Disney fairy tale movie. I never saw it. Director Kenneth Brandall didn't lazily rehash the 1950 version. People bring that one up. See, I didn't saw it. see it. I just thought it was a remake. So maybe I'll check it out. And said he wanted to create the best version possible. So he distilled the best elements of the Peralt Grimm, Prokovive, 1950, and several other versions. Okay, interesting. Um, well, looks like I'm out of time for this, guys. So let's go ahead and wrap it up there. Your uh, your homework for this week is to think about the big ideas and plan the big stuff. So it is going to be um, think about the genre you're going to write in, the setting, the, the characters, the general story, and to think about the meta elements. How much time are you going to spend writing each day? Uh, how, how, how many hours is it going to take you to write a thousand words? Uh, things like that. So that's, that's the stuff that you're really going to think about over the next... Um, 1,000 words. How long is it going to take you to write that? That's what you need to think about over the next thing. You're going to plan the meta. You also need to think about budget. Your budget can be zero. For this project, I would not spend too much more than $100. Okay? Five, six. Um, and that's probably what you want to, what you want to think of. Uh, and that's going to give you your length. You're going to decide your length. If you can, if you can write more than um, twenty thousand words, you can do that. Oh, uh, forty bucks. Thank you, Contrarian. Here's forty to consider it. Barton Fink and Blood Meridian. Love your stuff, man. Okay, I'll uh, copy that and I'll paste it somewhere. Bam! Wow, that's huge. Here we go. Oh, that's not going to work. Now it's upside down. Good job, David. There you go. Oh, I like this. It looks so cool. What font is this? Gaudi 30. Woo! It looks so academic, guys. Put this on a diploma. Oh, here's the last thing I'll say, guys. Last thing I say. It's not homework. Yeah. So last thing I'll say. If you complete a project for this, I will find a way to like blast it or share it and get you some exposure as part of this. So I'll create I'll put it in, I'll put it together as part of a collection and, and like put it out on a site so like it'll have like, you know, maybe Everybody's book, I'll find a way for everybody's book to be in some kind of package, like on BookFunnel or InstaFreebie or something, to just kind of spam out uh, on Twitter and get people to download your book and read it and maybe get 
get on a mailing list for you and get to know you and get started on the marketing aspect because that's really what we wanted to use this. It's a tool for getting attention, getting your name out there, building a brand. That's what you want to think as well as an exercise in creativity. You should be exercising your creativity at every step along the way, changing up what I have to say, trying to do it in an original way, rebelling against what I have to say. It doesn't matter as long as you are trying to do something new and original with what you're doing. Um, I think you're going to be doing a great, great job. Um, but if you if you do complete something for this project at the end of the six weeks, um, I'll I'll give you some exposure. Um, I'll find a way to, I haven't decided on it yet. You can tell me, think of some creative ways. So at least it'll be, I could put it as part of a collection. Um, I could even, we could even publish it as part of a collection on Amazon to just have a free collection of like 20 novellas that just have a bunch of email address links in it people could download it you know if you're going to do it as a free book anyway uh, that wouldn't be something i would make any money on by the way <laughs> if it's free i won't make money it's just something that's like a way to get you guys some more exposure what's your opinion of uh taking your idea of a fan fiction rewrite for an already made story and using it in an original story it's great just change the name of the characters and change up enough stuff that it's obviously not the original thing and then you're good how much homework does count toward your final? If you do everything I tell you, you'll have a book at the end. That's your final grade. <laughs> How do I end my autobiography with, out, uh, with talking about the life lesson that was learned? I learned that, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, could you mention which email? Stu at dvspress.com or Stu, S-T-U at davidvstuart.com. There you go, guys. And email me any questions. I'll either get them back on email or do them on the stream or both. So thanks so much for watching. I hope you guys have found this informative and fun. Um, and uh, I'll see you guys next time. Have a great, great night. Oh, making an anthology. Yes, that's what I was thinking. So I could do an anthology. You guys talk about it. Send me emails with your ideas. We'll talk about it in the future as we get closer to publication. I just want to give people a reward for completing something, a little bit of exposure. I can use my platform to help you. Let me help you. If everybody, uh, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats, the more people that are doing great, the more everybody's doing great. That's it, folks. Um, I'll see you guys next time.